a pleasure to be here tonight to share with all of you some of the research that Brant and my team um, have been focusing on, specifically um, around the topics food, feed, and climate change uh, with some emerging opportunities for shore-based seaweed aquaculture. As I'm sure all of us in the room know, global human population continues to increase and is expected to exceed 9 billion people by the year 2050. With this increasing human population, um, we see a growing need to identify sustainable sources of food. And looking to the oceans, we've seen that the amount of seafood that we're pulling out of the ocean has continued to increase. So we're seeing an increase in demand for uh, seafood from the ocean. But what you'll notice is that the uh, orange line, sorry, so the, we've seen an increase in the demand. The, the orange wedge has essentially stabilized. And this wedge represents the amount of seafood that is wild harvested from the ocean. So that means we've essentially reached the capacity of wild harvested seafood from the ocean. The blue wedge represents the amount of seafood that is produced through aquaculture activities. And in 2014, the amount of seafood produced through aquaculture actually exceeded that from wild harvested sources. And this trend is expected to increase, obviously, with the increase in human populations. And so that leads us to investigate the aquaculture industry in a bit more detail. If you look at the US fisheries in terms of billions of dollars on the y-axis, you can see that we import the dark blue line, we import an extensive amount of seafood while also exporting some seafood from the US, but at a much smaller um, amount. And this uh, sums up to us in the US importing greater than 80% of the seafood that we consume domestically. And that's more than twice what we export. This creates a large trade deficit. Um, also, most of this, the seafood that we're importing is coming from aquaculture-based activities in Southeast Asia, um, overseas. And while at the same time, we're exporting some of our incredibly high quality seafood that we produce here. In fact, a lot of uh, the fisheries even here in San Diego are exported to um, Asia from a variety of different seafood products. So this creates a really big trade deficit, which also gives us an opportunity. Um, why are we spending so much money importing seafood when we can actually be producing it here in the US and specifically here in California? Um, Aquaculture is certainly on the rise. Um, we've seen aquaculture growing at about 1% per year. Um, there's certainly a lot of opportunity for aquaculture here in the US, whether we think about um, all the varieties of shellfish, oysters, mussels, clams, um, as well as even marine plants. Um, there's certainly opportunity for fin fish aquaculture. This is a bit more controversial due to some of the techniques and technology that uh, fin fish aquaculture uses, but it's certainly, there certainly are sustainable um, options for doing that. And so we know that there's a huge potential for aquaculture in the US. Um, it's a slow growing industry, but it is on the rise. Um, so given that we know aquaculture is going to be continuing to increase in the US, we need to start exploring what species are going to be um, the most viable and, and potentially the most sustainable in terms of giving us an opportunity to grow local species without having an impact on the associated ocean and ocean resources. If we look at uh, world aquaculture production, so just taking a look at what species or what groups of organisms are produced from aquaculture, we see those sectors are broken down into aquatic animals, crustaceans, mollusks, fin fish, and aquatic plants. And while you'll notice that all of those bars are increasing over time, um, if we take a look just at the white square, um, this is the aquatic plants that would include seaweeds, we also see that those bars are getting bigger. So we're seeing an increase in aquaculture production of marine plants, um, both in terms of millions of tons produced as well as the, um, the annual revenue or uh, profit associated with that in terms of US billions of dollars. So while the majority of global aquaculture does fall into the shellfish and finfish sectors, we're also seeing an increase in aquaculture activities associated with marine or aquatic plants. So let's take a closer look at the global seaweed market. 
Um, the, the global commercial seaweed market was estimated or valued at $10 billion in 2015 and is expected to more than double by 2024. So growing at a compound annual growth rate of 10% from 2017 to 2021. So that's what we're looking towards in the next five years. Um, and 10% is actually quite good, right? So um, we're seeing an increase in global seaweed production. Um, and we need to t start exploring how this is going to play out in the US. We know that um, the majority of seaweed growth is happening in Southeast Asia um, in terms of seaweed production. So let's take a closer look at how the US might actually fit into the global seaweed market. Um, if we look at the amount of seaweed produced in terms of millions of tons in world production, you'll note that the US sits down here with less than 2% of global production of seaweeds. If we take a look at where most of this is occurring, we can see that in terms of millions of metric tons of wet weight, um, countries such as China, um, Japan, Korea, as well as places like Indonesia and the Philippines are at the top of the list. Um, the rest of the world sits in that tiny little green uh, wedge at the top and that's where the US would be. So if we think about, okay, so most of the seaweeds being produced in other countries around the world, um, where do we in the US get most of our seaweed from? So you, in, here in the US, we import 98% of the seaweed that's consumed here. And we're importing it largely from South Korea, Japan, and China, with some other countries also contributing. And these numbers have continued to increase recently with the increased popularity of things like seaweed snacks that you now can find uh, covering the shelves in places like Trader Joe's and Whole Foods Market, which weren't really even there 10 years ago. So we're seeing a, a large amount of um, seaweed being consumed here in the US, but we're only producing 2% of that consumption. Okay, so you might say, why are we talking about seaweed? I understand that there are a lot of important other species like I, you know, mussels and oysters are delicious, but I don't really eat seaweed and why is it important? <laughs> um, so I'm here to convince you that seaweed has an incredibly diverse uh, number of uses and it's an incredibly underutilized resource here in the US and in California in particular. So some of the primary uses that we might be somewhat familiar with are of course food. Seaweed is also used as feed, so when we think about other animals besides people. Um, seaweeds are also vastly used for the natural products that they produce, and this is a whole group of, of chemical compounds that different seaweeds produce that have a whole variety of really important uses in human societies, as well as climate change mitigation, and I'll get to that um, in a minute. So first, if we start just looking at the, the applicability of seaweed as food, interestingly, humans have been consuming seaweed um, dating back to the origins of humans inhabiting coastlines. Um, I found some really fun factoids, um, little statements uh, recently. For example, in Japan in 703 AD, uh, the emperor confirmed that people could pay their taxes in seaweed. So if people brought the emperor seaweed, they would get their taxes um, essentially accounted for. Um, in Scotland, people have been using seaweed as fodder for sheep as well as for human food, um, dating back to the Neolithic period, roughly 5,000 years ago and more. Um, even, even older, we found chewed bits of seaweed in the floor of middens um, in a medicine hut of Monte Verde, Chile, which is one of the oldest human habitation sites in the Americas dating back 12,500 years ago. So we know that people have been using seaweed both as food and as, um, as uh, essentially medicine as well as feed for animals for um, essentially for the entire uh, time that humans have inhabited coastlines. Um, when we think about seaweeds, they're generally currently tied to Asian cuisines, and that's because a lot of the seaweeds that we consume now in the US, they have Asian names. So we're familiar with going and eating sushi and eating the nori that the sushi rolls are wrapped in. Um, that's probably the most familiar seaweed that, that the general public is comfortable eating. Um, perhaps we also might eat seaweed salad, which is shown in the upper right. 
Um, this is a different type of seaweed, but is very common in Japanese restaurants. Or perhaps now with the explosion of the poke um, trend, which is eating raw uh, seafood salad, especially uh, with, with tuna, shown in the upper left, um, that is often served with a red seaweed commonly known as ogo. So maybe we're familiar with some of these um, species of seaweed because they have uh, a name and association with some sort of cuisine in, in an Asian, um, one of these Asian countries. Um, many other cultures have traditionally consumed seaweed, but a lot of that knowledge has been lost. Um, for example, in Ireland, um, we've been make, they've been making um, Irish pudding, which is shown in the middle, with uh, red seaweed for hundreds of years and is still consumed today. It's quite delicious, uh, just flavored with vanilla. Um, so nonetheless, many of these seaweeds are known to be highly nutritious, but they're generally underutilized in the US. And in fact, most of the seaweeds that we do consume in the US um, are either dried or they're heavily processed. And so we're actually use it, losing a lot of the nutritional um, capacity of these marine plants. For example, for all of us who love to eat seaweed salad, the picture shown on the upper right, um, if you've ever noticed, every time you've ordered seaweed salad in a Japanese restaurant, it always looks exactly the same. It always tastes exactly the same, which is a delicious rice wine vinegar, shoyu, honey um, type of flavor. But the reason for that is because it's all pre-made in Asia, typically in China, packaged in large bricks and shipped over to the US on a container ship. So that's why it all tastes the same. Um, and unfortunately, they typically, when you see a dish like that, it's got artificial food colors added to it to maintain, uh, to give it a more attractive uh, color than what it would typically have, which would be a little bit of a muted greenish brown color, which isn't as vibrant as that uh, bright green bowl. Um, in fact, that's actually a brown seaweed that is making the seaweed salad, so you can tell it does have a little bit of food coloring in it. Nonetheless, we have species that are similar to that species here in California that we could be making our own uh, locally sourced fresh seaweed salad rather than eating this heavily preserved and pickled, who knows how old um, type of seaweed salad. I'm not trying to convince you guys to stop eating seaweed salad because I'm actually here to try to convince you to eat more seaweed. Um, but there are better ways of eating seaweed than eating that uh, large carbon footprint type of seaweed salad that many of us are familiar with. Um, so seaweeds are also known as a superfood, and this is one of the main reasons why all of us should really be eating more seaweed. What does that actually mean? If you just Google seaweed and uh, food, you'll find all kinds of, of news articles, um, all kinds of chefs and health movements around the world are really promoting the use of seaweed as in human diets. This was my favorite uh, article, is seaweed the magical bacon unicorn of vegetables? Um, there is a type of seaweed that actually has a bacon flavor, so maybe it actually is. Um, so there's all kinds of excitement in the public, especially with uh, gourmet chefs and people that are you know, looking to find another superfood. So we're used to thinking about kale as a superfood, right? And when we think about a superfood, we're typically thinking about organisms that have that are very nutritious. So seaweeds are, by definition, an order of magnitude higher in vitamins and minerals than any leafy green vegetable that we can grow on land. Um, they are incredibly high in soluble fiber, which is a type of fiber that's really good for promoting healthy gut microbiota in humans. Um, they're very high in protein, very low in carbohydrates, very low in fat aside from omega-3 fatty acids, which many of us take as supplements. Um, seaweeds are the producers of the omega-3 fatty acids. They're estimated to be about five calories per serving. So when you think about putting all of this together, they're really uh, a nutritional bomb that um, you know, has all of the things that we're typically looking for in food and, and doesn't have the things that we're not. Many of the carbohydrates that seaweeds produce are actually undigestible by humans. So when we are looking for low carb type of food, this is a good option. 
They're also an incredibly uh, good source of iodine, which we know is really important for thyroid function. Seaweeds are very high in calcium, which is great for bone health. And they also have all kinds of secondary metabolites and other photosynthetic pigments, things known as phenolics, um, which can act as antioxidants, um, which are also incredibly important. Seaweeds have been known to stabilize blood sugar, so uh, good for people with diabetes, good for heart, heart health, and they're a really great prebiotic. So when you think about all of the things that they offer in terms of health benefits, the, the benefits are just um, quite high and kind of mind-boggling, in fact. Um, when we think about the use of seaweeds as food and as a supplement, you can find things like in an ancient Chinese text referring to mineral-rich sea vegetables, they noted that there is no swelling that is not relieved by seaweeds. So seaweeds are, have also been found to be really good at, at um, being an anti-inflammatory. So any type of swelling in the human body can also be potentially reduced by seaweed. So they've been an incredibly important source of food for humans in the past and still are in some cultures, but I would argue that they're an incredibly undertapped, undertapped and underutilized resource here in California and in the US um, that we need to be exploring more. Um, seaweeds are also important for, for a few other uses that I'll touch on today. Um, one is use as feed. So typically when we think about agricultural crops, they're used, uh, aquacultural crops, sorry, if we think about fin fish aquaculture, feeding those fin fish, 70% um, of the harvested fish meal and oil is contained in that, the, those aquaculture feeds. So we're trying to grow tuna and we're feeding the tuna protein that we've harvested from the ocean. We're not, you know, we're not feeding them plants grown on land. We're harvesting things from the ocean to feed to the tuna that we're trying to grow in pens. And this is not a sustainable source of protein when you think about um, that the demand for this wild harvested um, source of fish meal to feed our fish will exceed demand by 20, 2040. Um, the supply will exceed demand by then. So we need to find a way of making the feed that we're feeding the fish that we're trying to aquaculture more sustainable. And one option is by feeding them um, plants or marine plants, seaweeds. We can incorporate seaweeds into a whole variety of different feed, uh, feed sources, um, whether it be for aquacultured fish or even for our livestock. Um, all of the benefits that I've mentioned that seaweeds have for humans, uh, they carry over to other animals. So why wouldn't we be feeding our cows or our sheep or our goats uh, seaweed as well, because they can essentially um, experience all of the same benefits that we would as humans from eating seaweeds. So seaweeds and algae are being uh, more commonly incorporated into both aquacultured fish meal as well as into feed for livestock. And then the seaweeds are also incredibly important natural, for the natural products that they produce. And when I say natural products, I mean um, contained within seaweed, they have a whole variety of different chemicals that they produce. Seaweeds are an incredibly diverse group of organisms. So if we think about all of the plants that, that grow on land, all of the green plants, they all evolved from one green algal ancestor. In the ocean, we have three different groups of seaweed, red, brown, and green. Remember, all land plants evolved from one green algal ancestor, and now we have two other very large groups, the red algae, the brown algae, and the green algae, with each with thousands of species globally. And because seaweeds have been on the planet for so long, much longer than terrestrial plants, they've evolved all kinds of interesting chemicals to avoid predation by grazers. So seaweeds are known for producing a lot of anti-herbivore compounds. This is to prevent things from eating them, essentially. Well, when we look at those compounds now, a lot of them end up being really interesting from um, maybe a health perspective, maybe a drug discovery per perspective, or a variety of other things, which I'll touch on here. So one of the uh, the largest global seaweed industries is for the, the polysaccharides that seaweeds produce. So in their cell walls, they produce a polysaccharide 
um, different types of polysaccharides depending on the group of algae. Some of you may be familiar with carrageenan, agar, or alginate. And these are all gel-like substances, and they all have different gel properties, different gel thicknesses. Um, and they're used widely in human uh, society, ranging from anything that's low fat or non-fat or even non-dairy. So any of us that might drink um, almond milk or soy milk or rice milk or any of those dairy alternatives. Um, if the easiest way to, to link carrageenan with some of the human products is, um, and, and what it was kind of first used in is in chocolate milk. So if you try to make chocolate milk at home, you put a scoop of dried chocolate powder in your milk and you stir it up, um, it doesn't really mix that well, or if it does, after a while it's gonna separate out, right? You're not gonna have the chocolate just perfectly mixed into your milk. So carrageenan was used to suspend the chocolate into the milk. It has a very silky consistency. Um, so chocolate milk is, is often very um, creamy and silky, and the carrageenan is used as an emulsifier, as a stabilizer, as a binding agent. It helps the, the chocolate stay stabilized throughout that um, that liquid. Well, the same thing is true with almond milk, cashew milk, or any of those nut milks, because the nuts would all sink to the bottom, even in its powder form, if you didn't have carrageenan or some sort of gel that was emulsifying that liquid and keeping things um, essentially suspended in liquid. Um, so these products are used in thousands of human products, not only ranging from our, our non-dairy products, but they're also used in deli meat to provide a kind of a stabilized structure for slicing. They're contained in all kinds of cosmetic products like shaving cream and whipping cream. They're found in ice cream as well as even um, carrageenan is often used to help make a very nice head on beer. So all of us who like to drink beer, there could be seaweed in your beer that you don't even know about. Um, so this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And most of the seaweeds for polysaccharides, for carrageenan and agar and alginate, are largely produced in developing nations. Indonesia, the Philippines, and Tanzania are the largest locations, or the, the largest producers of this type of seaweed. Um, and this generally probably won't work for, for an industry here in the US just because of the cost of labor. Um, and they're able to grow vast seaweed farms out, um, and, and they're largely, a lot of them are produced in the tropics. So, um, but this is a really important industry from the seaweed perspective that's worth mentioning. There are other natural products aside from these cell wall polysaccharides, including cosmetics. So again, all the things that are contained in seaweeds, the vitamins and minerals that you can get if you eat them, you can also put them into a body lotion and your skin can absorb a lot of those different compounds. So any of us familiar with La Mer, which happens to be one of the most expensive body products that we can buy, um, one small little container of La Mer is $500. And it's largely produced by um, some of the main ingredients in it are seaweeds, seaweed products. Um, increasingly, you can find seaweed products in any kind of, uh, well, actually, even you can find them even in Ralph's or Vons, but Whole Foods will have many different options for seaweed lotions, seaweed conditioner, because the texture uh, of those gels and of some of the oils that you might find in seaweeds actually do provide a really nice um, uh, just texture for putting on our skin. Um, they also contain antioxidants that are known to prevent free radical formation um, that helps to prevent damage to the skin and help protect against aging, which of course we all would be happy to have. Um, and they are also known just to be a great moisturizer and may actually help combat acne. So again, many different benefits for using seaweeds um, from a cosmetic perspective. You can go to some spas now and spend a lot of money to get wrapped in seaweed. Um, I know in Ireland they have entire spas where you can take baths and different types of seaweed that are known to have different health benefits. So certainly uh, popular in this industry. Other important things are seaweeds and drug discovery. So many of you are probably familiar, but even at Scripps we have um, a whole entire group of natural products chemists that are focused on trying to identify unique drugs from the sea. And seaweeds, along with some 
cyanobacteria, different types of marine bacteria have been kind of the focal uh, area for some of these scientists because they produce so many interesting chemical compounds. Many chemical compounds that we don't even know the potential uses as of yet. But one interesting example is this red alga down here. This is called Delicia. And um, it has incredible antimicrobial properties. So this picture here shows a tiny piece of Delicia sitting on a Petri dish with a microbial culture around it. And you can see the white halo is showing that Delicia is essentially preventing the bacteria from growing anywhere near it. And so it has incredibly strong antimicrobial properties, which has then been used in human uh, human products. So basically, the compounds extracted from Delicia are now painted on things like pacemakers. So when we put a pacemaker or some other sort of artificial substance in our body, that creates a surface area where bacteria can go and settle. And you don't want bacteria growing and settling on anything inside your body because that can lead to disease and other things. So we have to have these anti-fouling, antimicrobial compounds to prevent bacteria from fouling or settling on things like pacemakers, and Delicia is the source of one of these compounds. Um, we've also found really interesting compounds from other seaweeds that could potentially be a candidate for treating lung cancer or even tumors and AIDS. Um, and a whole variety of other compounds are in active clinical trials for a whole variety of different diseases. That, that could be a whole separate talk just talking about drugs from the sea because um, the, the potential is really endless with this. Um, then the, <laughs> last but not least, in terms of important uses of seaweed from the sea, does anyone know why I would be putting a cow next to a seaweed? Carbon emissions, I heard? OK. So carbon emissions, cows and seaweed are, in fact, linked. Not with kelp, per se, but actually with this beautiful red seaweed known as asparagopsis. So when you think about cows, what's the main type of thing that they produce that could be, yeah, methane. So methane is produced by cattle in a large quantity, in large quantities. However, despite what many of us might think, <laughs> most of the methane produced by cows is not from this, but it's actually from burps. So cows burp 90 to 95% of the methane that they produce, which is just essentially being released right into the atmosphere. And this poses a real big challenge for cattle farmers because we can manage the waste products from cows. We can turn cow waste into fuel, but burps just go straight into the atmosphere, right? How do we manage that? It's very challenging, and some people have come up with very creative ways <laughs> of essentially trying to capture the methane that's produced by cows by putting these you know, deflated balloons on their back. And every time they burp, they slowly fill the balloon, and then they can capture the methane and do something with it. But this, you can imagine, would be um, in terms of trying to scale this up and making it sustainable or having an actual impact on methane emissions and livestock could be quite costly and perhaps not the most efficient. So that is where the red seaweed, Asparagopsis taxiformis, comes into the scene. This red alga is known to produce a suite of really interesting compounds, um, these things known as brominated compounds that have been shown initially in experiments in Australia where some scientists were working on fermentation in cow guts. And they knew about this asparagopsis producing a variety of interesting compounds. And so they had bacteria from cow guts growing in petri dishes. And they were able to show that when you put a very small amount of the seaweed in with those bacteria, that they could prevent methane formation. OK, this is in a petri dish, not in a cow. So fast forward to just last year, where a group of scientists at UC Davis have been studying this um, interesting problem. And they were able to show for the first time that if you feed live cows a very small amount of this seaweed dried, so we're talking about 1 to 2% 
um, of the cow's daily intake of this asparagopsis supplement that they could reduce um, cow burping production of methane by 70 to 90 percent depending on how much they were feeding them. Of course, this study was only two weeks long and it was largely limited by the supply of asparagopsis because the study was using wild harvest asparagopsis that was collected in Australia. Um, however, we have asparagopsis growing here in California, um, but the seaweed is quite complicated and is difficult to, uh, to grow in captivity, which I'll get back to in a second. But just to take a step back, let's think about methane. So when we think about our greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide is, of course, the most prevalent form of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, methane coming in at just 10%. However, when we look at the impact of these different greenhouse gases, if we compare um, one pound of methane to carbon dioxide, we see that while methane is less abundant in the atmosphere, and methane actually only persists in the atmosphere for 12.4 years, as opposed to carbon dioxide, which can stick around in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. Um, but methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas. That means that it, um, one ton of methane is able to capture a lot more energy than one ton of CO2. And so it's estimated to be 23 times more potent in terms of its heat trapping capacity than carbon dioxide over a 100 year cycle. So when we think about this, all of these things combined, methane's very potent greenhouse gas. It doesn't stay in the atmosphere for very long. And so if we can find ways to reduce it, we can actually have a really big impact on greenhouse gas warming of our planet. So thinking about this um, cow problem, this could be a really important way of thinking about reducing methane production. When we look at methane production globally, we see that there are a lot of natural sources of methane production shown in the green. If we look at the anthropogenic or human derived production of of methane, we see that agriculture and waste is, makes up the majority of that. Okay, now let's take a closer look at agriculture. Global emissions from just the cattle, milk, and beef supply chains alone, the turquoise wedge is coming from enteric methane. That's methane that's produced during fermentation in the guts of ruminant animals, cows, etc. And so this goes to show that um, if we're able to manage that turquoise wedge, we can actually have quite a big impact on greenhouse gas um, emissions in not just in the US, but globally. So it's been estimated that if that UC Davis study and the numbers that they produced from that study could be applied across the worldwide livestock industry, we would eliminate two gigatons of methane emissions annually. And this is about a quarter of the entire amount of greenhouse gases that the US produces annually. So this is a huge amount of, uh, of potential. However, let's just keep in mind that um, the research is still early in terms of knowing about the long-term effects of feeding the seaweed to cows. Um, and in fact, the UC Davis scientists who I'm currently collaborating with on this project um, are just running their second study. And this one is gonna be um, for a lot longer than the two weeks. And we need to evaluate how asparagopsis feeding might affect um, dairy production, flavor of milk, um, even you know, cow health overall. And so that's what's essentially being done right now. Um, so this just brings me to hopefully having convinced you guys that seaweeds are an incredibly important resource. And in my mind, one of the most underutilized marine resources here in the US and in California in particular. If we look just in California, we have hundreds of species of native seaweeds that are living on our shores very few of which are used in any kind of the, any of these industries. I mentioned asparagopsis, the cow, uh, the magical cow unicorn. <laughs> um, we have that growing here in Southern California and we now have it growing in my lab and it's one of the active areas of research where we're trying to understand how can we grow that seaweed? How can we potentially envision scaling it up to, to produce enough even to feed 
California's cows, let alone the US and the world beyond. Um, so there's a lot of research that needs to go into this, but there's a lot of very exciting opportunities with that, but also with exploring some of the culinary um, adventures that these seaweeds offer to us here in California. Um, there are many species with existing commercial market, but there's just very few, uh, there are very few businesses in California that are actually producing seaweed to meet the potential demand that these seaweeds could have. Um, so with that, that is essentially where the relationship between Brent and I evolved um, in kind of taking advantage of this opportunity and, and looking towards the future to explore some of the potential that exists in California. So I'm gonna transition over to our team here, California Seaweed Company. And Brent, come on up. Good evening and thank you so much to Jen for laying down that solid foundation of seaweed knowledge for all of us to build on. My name is Brian Klebowski and I have the opportunity to take that foundation and I'm gonna describe one small sliver of the opportunity that she discussed, which is the culinary use application. And I hope after that series of information, we all can understand that we truly are in the dawn right now of an aquacultural revolution. It's happening primarily elsewhere in the world, but it's coming to our shores and it's coming to our plates and we have a way to shape it if we start taking proactive measures now. So I'll be taking that arc from basically my master's capstone project in Jen's lab to the creation of a company. And going back to school, you might have heard in the bio there was a pretty big gap of 10 years from my undergrad time to coming back to Scripps. And it's basically maybe more or less a PhD's worth of time in the business world where I was either working in marketing or business development for these startup companies you know, marketing different products and slowly coming back towards sustainability. But the Venn diagram you see up there is essentially the three areas I was trying to combine coming back to Scripps, right? So I had a marine science and sustainability background and interest, business development experience, and was looking to find how to marry all those with Scripps. And when you think about it, aquaculture and food is really right down the middle of all three, right? Because you're thinking of applying business in a profitable way, marine science and sustainability, and food production is something ubiquitous. Everyone here is eating food and interested in it. So it's kind of across humanity, this unifying aspect. So it's not crazy that I found my way to working on a seaweed project. And basically starting on the left there, we're essentially starting with a few questions, like basically, can we grow it? So a really rudimentary setup started with coolers and aquaria, plumbing some water in. And you can see the excitement, because as a gardener building terrestrial gardens, I was so excited that I was finally having a chance to experiment with growing with plants from the sea, or seaweed from the sea. And following that journey to the other side of the, the screen there, which is presenting the business idea here at a startup competition that actually ended up giving us the first financial seed money to formally legally incorporate the company and uh, take us to where we are today. So I'll cover a little bit of that arc in the next few minutes. And really the four main questions that are guiding that story will be these four you see here. First of all, as Jen described more generally in aquaculture, but for seaweed specifically, is this the right time and is this the right place, right? Is there an economically viable opportunity? Do all of you out here, are you interested and able to support that market essentially? So that was where we started square one. Then can we grow it? Just like you saw in the aquarium here, can we grow it happily? Can we grow it at scale? Um, and how do we grow it better? And then the fun part, taking it off campus and getting to have contact with these local chefs. So are the chefs interested in using it or are they gonna look at you like you're crazy and ask you to get out of their restaurants? <laughs> you know, and do they really see a difference between the imported product that Jen described are the 98% of what we're, we have in our markets here versus this fresh local ingredient? And then finally, if that's a yes, do you have to build a brand and you have to build a company and you have to take it out into the real world in order to actually realize all four of those answers? So starting with the timing and the opportunity, Jen described the $10 billion opportunity for seaweed aquaculture alone. About half of that relates to food and nutrition. So that's already a pretty big chunk there. The US is hovering at a much smaller amount at $100 million a year currently, but we believe that in Southern California alone, based on some of our research, that there's at least an underutilized market of $10 million in that fresh, local, premium seaweed market. 
Jen also mentioned the 98% that we import, and it's worth stating that it's 98% of the total $100 million here. That's one of the largest trade deficits that we have with something that we have growing right off our shore that we actually are having have more of a carbon footprint and a longer travel time to get to our plates. Not only that we don't know who grew it, or we're interacting and supporting our, our local kind of working waterfront and our local food supply. So I think that's an important feature that at least initially on showed me that there has to be some way to capture some of that market. Breaking out that $100 million a year market, there's basically three buckets you can think about it. So on the 98% of it is in those first two on the left. Those are the imported and either served modified with food dyes and food colorings we heard about, or they're processed and packaged, and you see them in plastic, and they can be anywhere from a healthy snack to something that's effectively seaweed candy. So again, you know, this isn't necessarily supporting any local industry and is the majority of what we're getting, whereas on the far right, the 2% the to 1% is domestic su uh, supplied. The foraged component, people are going out at basically the lowest tides after a long growing season, collecting and harvesting from the wild in mass bringing it on shore, drying it out, and then kind of dribbling out that production to market over the course of the year. So when you think about scaling, when you think about actually going out into the ecosystem and harvesting point, you can't really go beyond a certain sustainable carrying capacity of a given area. You're limited by weather. You're limited by where you can get to the seaweeds, right? Ocean farming is another opportunity that's being done in places where the, or the area, the actual topography, and the ocean allow it. So areas off Alaska, the East Coast, where there's embayments, where you have a little bit more protection from open ocean swell, wind, and maybe also favorable permitting environments, where California has a lot more restrictions on what you can do where. And there's a lot of people that are interested in using the ocean. So you can imagine there's a laundry list of agencies and interests that want to use the same square meter of surface of the ocean. But there's another opportunity for domestic production. That's one we started with, which is shore-based tank culture. So this is using seawater, but using tanks on land and not affecting the natural ecosystem offshore to grow seaweeds. Taking to the timing, and is it mainstream enough? So I love Vogue as an example, because this is from two weeks ago. And they're asking, not is seaweed palatable, but is seaweed the perfect food, right? And Vogue, granted, is not a scientific journal. They're not a culinary magazine. But I think it's most exciting for exactly that reason, because they are commercing in fashion and trends in their marketing mainstream, or like right up ahead of mainstream kind of media's attention, right? And if they're asking these questions, and they're not asking, is it palatable, but is it perfect? That's a good sign of kind of the economic, the timing, and the mainstream sensibility aligning. So I think that that would answer number one, that yes, there is an opportunity and the timing seems to be right. So from a producer, if you're actually going to farm it, why would you consider fresh California seaweeds here? Well, first of all, in terms of just density of nutrition, they're highly productive for the same given area. So whether you're talking about a square foot or an acre, you're getting more nutrition value from that area than you would be from almost any other crops, as Jen described, sometimes 10 to 1. Also, there's a really short time to harvest. So the three species we have here are three that we've been working with and growing outdoors. They can double in as little as two to three weeks. So compare that to a terrestrial crop where you plant a seed, you water it, you wait, and it could take months. So this can be constantly harvested vegetatively. So you're div constantly doubling, dividing in half to market, half back to seed. Um, so you have this really fast turnover. And really in California, another one that you can't kind of overstate is the freshwater component. As we have more people in California and more freshwater instability from droughts, we're really going to be competing with drinking water or agriculture water if you're trying to grow more food here. But seaweed doesn't impact either of those uses. So you have a nice kind of three-part win right there for the growers. And why would chefs or the consumer be interested? Well, if you think about seafood, there's not too many vegetarian options, right? So if you're interested in getting a taste of the sea, Veg uh, seaweed's a great way to start. It also has what's been recently described as the fifth flavor, which is umami. So you're, everyone's familiar with sweet, salty, sour, bitter. But umami is kind of this meaty, rich flavor. Just like it's hard to describe salt without describing the foods that are associated with it, umami is that similar way. But seaweed imparts that to dishes or drinks that it is mixed with. So that's 
an interesting component for a chef to play with that's dealing with high-end culinary uh, techniques. And then the 10x nutrition. If you're thinking about a pound of spinach versus a pound of seaweed or an even smaller amount, there's a lot of nutrition in every single bite there. So can we grow it? So we took three of those species. Actually, I'll go back so you can see them again. Uh, the left green seaweed is an ova species. The two other reds are a Gracilaria species and a Palmaria species. And that was the one that Jen highlighted as uh, the unicorn bacon of the sea. And I can confirm from Elise sauteing it in butter with a fish burrito, it does take on a similar texture and taste. But I wouldn't go as far as saying it's exactly one for one bacon. But <laughs> it's an exciting prospect to start from. So these are the three species we have in culture. And what you see in the blue tubs are essentially the replication of uh, the experimental uh, system we have built. So there, if you're uh, familiar with horseback riding, that's essentially uh, a muck bucket that we've plumbed with a standpipe and then an air ring. And so you get this like beautiful circular cell of rotation of water. And the seaweeds are really happy growing in there. And we can vary things that you would want to vary, just like if you're growing a tomato on land, right? So you want to know the density, the amount of light, the amount of water, and the kind of nutrients they want. So we can isolate each of those, maybe run it across nine different steps, and then look at where those sweet spots are for temperature, light, and for nutrients, refining that ideal growth formula for each of those species. And then once you have that at a small experimental scale, you can start to scale up. So going from maybe a 50 liter bucket to several hundred liters to a pilot production commercial production scale, which you see in the far right, which is an abalone farm in Santa Barbara, where they're cultivating uh, two red species of seaweed, in addition to the kelp they're feeding to the abalone. And lo and behold, the balanced diet of seaweeds makes the abalone grow better, have better meat, and have a better market value. So there's already existing infrastructure examples of co-location. Um, that's important because some of the infrastructure is really expensive, right? If you're thinking about pumps and pipes or building piers, You'd like to be able to co-locate with someone that's either shouldering some of the cost or would see you as maybe a subtenant that could work with them as you scale up. So this is the process we're going to see how well the equations that we've worked out basically in the growth formulas and the small scale can scale up. And this is the question three. Will chefs work with it? And I, I love this, this moment because this is literally the moment where my, uh, this is Chef Jude Deckman on the left. He's a Michelin star chef. He's got uh, numerous restaurants around, but he's probably best known for his restaurant in Valle Guadalupe in Baja, California, Mexico. Um, and Deckman's an old morgoer. So he's doing top-notch, local-only ingredients in this al fresco dining experience. And people are coming from all over to have that experience. I showed up on a Monday morning with a cooler full of seaweed and my chef friend and just tried to give him a chance to work with the seaweed. And instead of turning us away, he engages in a conversation. And if you look closely, you can almost see a thought popping out of my head of, I think there's something here. Like, how do we go to the next phase? <laughs> and one of the coolest parts about their conversation between the chefs was the notion that a premium ingredient can differentiate them from another chef across the street, right? If they're drawing a radius around the poultry that they're getting, and they're only getting live local seaweeds, and they won't use a dehydrated imported product, that differentiates them as a premium chef that's walking their talk when it comes to both the taste and the sustainability of their dishes. That led us to a cross-the-border opportunity here in Carlsbad, where Deckman invited us to a number of food events, one of the, one of the first being Atlanta Water Company, uh, owned by Chef Rob Ruiz here in Carlsbad and really led to about a dozen of different events where we got to actually get out there and give the chefs seaweed and see the artistry they can come up with. And some of it really just blew my mind. So here's one example. Chef Deckman put uh, the Gracilaria, so this red ogo, in the fridge and then blended it and then chilled it again. And now there's this puree of seaweed that he used as a puree next to this puck of ceviche, which is a center slide with uh, fresh raw seaweed on top of it. That's the Gracilaria again, the Ogo. And then you see on the right, the whole plate, which is basically an edible piece of art, right? So I, this again solidified the fact that if you give it to these chefs who are artists and understand the junction between science and, and art and how it relates to food, they can do amazing things with it. So it's really only limited by their imaginations. 
And here are some of the actual dishes they put together. So the upper left is the very first poke dish that Deckman threw in, maybe you know, a kind of a delicate, uh, more of a garnish than a premium ingredient. But then you can also see it used in cocktails on that ceviche puck over some crudo. And then on the lower right, um, Chef Robert Ruiz using basically a healthy third to third to third of the seaweed to uh, the additional ingredients to tuna. So there's a range there. It doesn't just have to be a garnish. It can be a premium ingredient. And um, I'll get to some of the willingness to pay, but people are kind of seeing it similar to ginger and avocado in terms of the price point of being able to add it to a product or to their dish. So that takes us into the fourth question, right? So if there's an opportunity, chefs are stoked, we can grow it, and the timing's right, how do we actually get it out the door? And you don't just turn on a company, right? You have to start at square one. And I love this definition of a startup because it really gets to the challenges of starting from nothing. And that's essentially a startup is just an organization looking for a repeatable and scalable business model. So until you find that, you're in this startup mode, just iterating, trying to find where your product can fit best in the market, how does it get there, and how do you find return customers? So if you're on any search party journey, you want to have a good team, right? You don't want to be wandering around by yourself. I've been extremely fortunate in that capacity to have people like Dr. Smith uh, and her student, Dr. Mike Fox, who's now at Woods Hole, helping me along the way. A senior development engineer here at Scripps, Dominic Mendola, who's been a pioneer in aquaculture research for almost three decades. Uh, and then support from ongoing students and staff, um, as well as volunteers. On the, the lower row, you see there three members from uh, the Rady School of Business Management here, Rady School of Management at UCSD, essentially our business school. And after a series of working through accelerators and kind of workshopping the startup idea, I pitched it to the Rady cohort of the Flex MBA people. And they took on the idea and said, oh, OK, we'll give it a shot. We'll go pitch it to our professor. I wasn't allowed to be in that pitch, but they, they did a good enough job to convince their professor to make it be essentially their vehicle that would give them an MBA. So they workshopped it through two and a half quarters. And so again, these people, these aren't you know, just out of high school or just out of undergrad. Um, Hannah was running a, a policy and NGO, um, one of the largest in the United States. Jared was working at Qualcomm, and Zach was working at NASCO, a billion dollar shipbuilding. So really good ops numbers and policy meets um, people uh, team. And they, the culmination of what they came up with was essentially a functional business plan that built on what I had started and basically checked that box of, is this an opportunity? So took that winning money from the pitch competition and formally gave it to the team, the lawyers, to incorporate California Seaweed Co. in June of 2018. So established 2017 is a little bit premature, but we <laughs> take a little bit more time than I expected. And if the next embedded video, instead of talking about the brand, I'd love to show you a 90 second video that we uh, made to introduce it to the, to the audience. At California Seaweed Company, our locally grown seaweeds are a healthy, sustainable superfood. We supply delicious, fresh, local seaweeds to the Southern California culinary market. Chefs prize seaweed umami flavor and crisp texture for use in seafood, sushi, salads, snacks, and cocktails. Seaweeds are an ancient food source that is 10 times more nutritious than any vegetable. Research shows that seaweeds improve gut health reduce health risks of obesity and diabetes, and also contain antiviral and anti-cancer properties. However, over 90% of seaweeds consumed in the United States are imported. Imported seaweed products are inferior as they are dehydrated and then shipped long distances, degrading nutrient content as well as altering taste and texture. The seaweeds are then rehydrated and served infused with food dyes and artificial flavors. Eating fresh seaweed tastes better, is healthier for you, and is better for the environment. At California Seaweed Company, it is our mission to grow the best quality culinary seaweeds for local Southern California restaurants. And our seaweed is grown right here in California with pristine Pacific Ocean water and the California sun. 
that's, that's essentially 90 seconds, you know, the overall vi vision. And really, it's, to, it's not aiming small. It's not just seaweed as a garnish, right? It's, it's seaweed on every plate. It's giving each of you the opportunity to choose if you want to consume local seaweeds and to expand beyond the limitations that we have currently. And we can do that by starting with these premium chefs that already walk in their talk. They're already doing this premium sourcing. And you probably already know them, so they can pre-vet the rest of their, their dishes. And we're doing that by scaling appropriately scaled onshore aquaculture of, of these systems, much like the one you saw in development here. And there's nothing like getting it out to the public, you know, pressing the flesh and seeing if people are responsive or withdrawn. And you know, this is one event that was shot down at um, the Scripps Forum here, the future of sustainable seafood. And we gave seaweed to a number of the different chefs, had them incorporating it with their own different dishes, some of which were underutilized uh, fish or shellfish from the local area. And Dr. Smith was a part of a panel discussing the opportunities and the challenges going forward. And this is just to highlight one of many events where every time we come back, we learn new questions, new insights, and we get more fired up. Um, this is, these are just a few of the events ranging from food innovation specific to just more general innovation uh, pitch competitions. Um, one that Jen put up was a Global Climate Action Summit with Dr. Leinen, the director of Scripps, which was amazingly inspiring because it was bringing together prime ministers from all over the world, delegates that normally would only be seen at a COP event, and just the support from the rest of the international community and their excitement, their genuine curiosity about seaweed brought us both back, I think, to campus with a whole new sense of inspiration um, to see it through the next stages. And I'd just like to point out the Trident Innovation Challenge. I had a chance to work at that when I was first coming back to grad school, and that was one of the competitions that we placed high enough to get some financial winnings out to actually be able to start the company. So a lot of it has really been born in, and raised right here in San Diego. And I guess I'll just wrap it up with saying how privileged we are to be working at Scripps because part of the mission is really understanding and protecting the planet. And maybe not too long ago it was primarily understanding it. And now we're understanding we have to take a more proactive stance in how to do that. And one of their main missions now is by solving the problems of tomorrow today. And I hope that in some small part we've convinced you that seaweed aquaculture, when done in the right way, can be a part of that solution. Thank you.